So even though you think it's your money in the bank at law, it's not. Uh, it's their money once you deposit it in their bank. I mean, if China couldn't get, you know, trust the dollar anymore, then what happens? And, you know, Russia can't really trust the dollar anymore. We cut them off for what, 300 million or something. You don't have to be in the new system in order for them to uh, basically stop any payment be conventional to the banking system or unconventional through a cryptocurrency. And if that doesn't scare you, I don't know what. Hello, guys. Welcome to Capital Cosm. Today, I have a special returning guest. It is David Morgan from the Morgan Report. David, thank you so much for coming back on, my friend. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it, Danny. As always, guys, nothing in this video is financial advice, so please do your own due diligence. Neither Dave, David nor I are financial advisors. So with that, Dave, you were my second ever interview. I really appreciate you coming back on. I, I appreciate you coming back on coming on in the first place to kind of help me get my first big break out in the uh, commodity investing interview scene. So much, uh, much kudos to you there. For the audience who may not know who you are, give us a brief rundown of your background really quick. Sure. I think the best way to get an in-depth, not that anyone needs my in-depth uh, background, but if you go to my landing page, themorganreport.com, and you hit the about page or the, the about tab, it goes basically through my background, but I uh, always was interested in money and finance. I question like, uh, you know, to me, you had to save money to buy something as a kid, as a young child. And, and I thought, well, how do you save enough to buy a skyscraper? <laughs> you know, and then I learned about banking, got interested in it. I um, really, my passion's always been finance and money, but uh, along that path, <clears throat> my dad kind of pushed me into uh a career path, which I really enjoyed. And that was uh, engineering, aeronautical engineering, and uh, particularly flying. So I learned to fly at 16 oh, wow. and 19. I had every rating you could get. I taught flying in college. I taught the Dean of Architecture to fly. Uh, I ended up in the military side as a contractor, not in the military, but working with the military. Did that with a number of years. But all through that time, I was uh, working toward financial planning. I was, you know, moonlighting. I was trading uh, in the futures market. I was looking at equities. I was learning about stocks and all that stuff self-taught. And then I came across the Austrian School of Economics very early on, started studying that on my own and realized that uh, that was a more truthful look at how the economy really works versus the Keynesian crap that I was taught for my master's in finance. So that's sort of it anymore. You can see on the about tab, but I had a uh, a drive, you might say, to get into this field. And I didn't know where it would lead. I was open-minded. And then I honed in on, you know, the only way to run a, <clears throat> a financial system is with honesty and truth. And we've gotten away from that totally. And this is like one of the reasons, <clears throat> in fact, to me, it's the primary reason that we're in the mess that we're in. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what are what's your overall view of the markets right now, the economics uh, scene, et cetera? The overall view is they're distorted as, as, all, as all get out. I mean, you've got these new highs in the stock market, which is supposed to give us an idea of how well the physical economy is doing. The physical economy is contracting like mad, and there's all kinds of you know frontline businesses that are either out of business or pared back substantially, laying people off. And then you see the guys at the top are selling out. You see, you know, Jimmy uh, Jamie Dimon. You see the Walmart uh, fortune. You see Zuckerberg, many of these elites that I call them are exiting the stock market uh, in a rather significant way. And yet you're making new highs. There's a discontinuity there. And you want some logic to look at it and say, hmm, this doesn't make sense. And, and they're again, to re yeah, and to reemphasize, look out your window. I mean, Main Street is not commensurate with a new high in the stock market. So I've said many times, but it bears repeating, there is a disconnect between the financial markets and what they're trying to brainwash the masses into and the physical economy that's, I would say, dying, but certainly uh, withering away. And that's something you have to bear in mind. You have to live in reality. And the reality in the financial system is um, it's broken. There isn't really a good 
connection between the stock markets and the physical economy. Yeah. So the, the markets have been going up irrespective of the geopolitical environment, the political environment, all of that stuff. Can the markets go on forever? The reason why I ask this is because if you look at like Weimar Republic, for example, they had insane inflation, but in the process of doing so, they also raised their market. Now, their markets didn't keep up with inflation. They went up nominally, but not in real terms. Is that something that you see is happening right now? Yeah, I actually changed my mind. You know, I'm certainly never said I had all the answers and I've always had more questions than answers. But I'd say about two years ago, I started to filter that into my, my thought process because up until then, I thought there's no way that the United States Treasury would get to a point where we go into a pseudo Weimar phase. But then I rethought it and said, you know what? Look, don't think. And you just, we've just said it, you know, the stock market just keeps making new highs. So I concluded that that possibility does exist, that you could get into a fundamental blow off, hyper, hyperbolic, <clears throat> straight up type of a move in the stock market that's not commensurate with the depreciation of the currency, but it's better staying in the currency, a la Zimbabwe, Weimar Republic, <clears throat> Turkey, and many of these stock exchanges, so you're better off to put your money in the equities than you are to leave it in the bank. Now, the money in your Weimar Republic stock market helped, but did not prevent you from losing purchasing power. The only thing at that time that did were the precious metals. And so I think that possibility exists. So I have rethought it, and I have done what you just outlined that, you know, we could get. And, you know, Martin Armstrong is a pretty deep thinker, and he's also got Socrates to kind of help, you know, to look at things objectively. And, you know, it's a money flow thing. If you keep printing money or producing more, you know, of the system, <clears throat> where does that go? And you really, the knowledgeable people know you really don't want to leave it in the bank and the currency. I mean, you want to play the spread. You want to give it to the Fed and make your, you know, 0.2% or 0.3% <clears throat> or whatever. But the money goes into something of value. And for the most part, that means a business that produces something and makes a profit. So it's a long answer, but I think it's when I really want to get out there. Thanks for asking, because I cannot rule it out. At one time, I oh, no way. You know, <clears throat> the moral correctness and the way the markets work, especially with being the reserve currency of the world, is the market will correct itself and say, hey, I'm not, these, you know, dollars have got to be worth something. And they are presently, but not much. And could we go to the point where we lose faith in the currency, which means, you know, yeah, you shoot in the equities, but, you know, the, the capital markets are really destroyed. In other words, if you don't trust a dollar tomorrow, why are you going to trust it for six months, you know, five years, 10 years, 30 years? Are you going to look at the bills, notes, and bonds as being valuable if you don't trust the currency today? If we go that way, which is a possibility then um, you're lost because it's really difficult to reboot the system once that happens. Uh, you can, but in the cases where that's happened in the past, you usually had to go straight to a gold tie of some type to get regained trust in the system. So there's a lot of questions out there. Is that the scenario that we're going to go through? And the answer is, I don't know, but I, again, can't rule it out anymore. Yeah, it sounds like a stagflationary scenario, right? When you've got stagnant economy and inflationary monetary forces That's yeah fine. you're sitting there struggling as a normal worker working their butts off so many people working two and three jobs to just basically make a living to exist and so you you know labor wise you're putting out more and more effort than ever before just to stay in one place and at the same time you're seeing this inflationary backdrop that you really can't escape from because you're not in the banking class or let's say a savvy investor that's got excess capital to deploy into this money game. It's really become a big gambling casino. And even as bad as the bond market is, I mean, most of the bond traders are your smartest guys, or at least they used to be in my studied view. But as smart as they are, they're still willing to gamble and, we're, and take a bond position, a big one, betting that interest rates are going to move either up or down. And that's great until the game 
bolt or it ends. And it's ending in my estimation. There's really no way out. I mean, the interest rate thing is um, curtailed inflation somewhat, perhaps, but not really. The psychology of inflation hasn't left. And that's a real driver because there's a lot more of us than there is of them, even though they control most of the capital. If the capital isn't worth anything, then what good does it do them? And they want to escape before, you know, ahead of the herd, so to speak. I mean, why do you think, as I said earlier, you've got, you know, Jamie Dimon and Zuckerberg and, you know, some of these entities that are leaving the stock market, they know what's coming. Yeah. Do you think that, uh, you've seen the M2 money supply chart, it's gone down for the first time in close to a hundred years, you know, at this, at this extent. And then do you think that that's a cause of people moving their money out of their deposits and into let's say treasuries? It is. I mean, money has a mind of its own and it goes where it's treated best. And if you're not getting, you know, a good interest rate on your money and you know that you can move to a money market or treasuries and, and the short term treasuries are probably always going to be valued. And I doubt, I don't think there's going to be a total reneging on the debt markets. I think there'll be a revaluation of them <clears throat> and we can go into that more if you want, but um, yeah. It looks for for the best situation it can. So if you know inflation's really say nine percent, and you're getting close to five percent, you're only losing four, but at least that's more or less guaranteed. Whereas if you have it in a speculative investment, you don't know what it's going to do. So there's been a huge shift out of the banks into the money markets, and that's uh, normal. You're going to go again where you're going to get the highest yield, and of course you want a quote unquote safe yield. And so you've seen a huge discrepancy between the bank's balance sheets as far as what they're actually holding as you know liabilities to them and assets to us. And then I always like to remind people that you're an unsecured creditor. So even though you think it's your money in the bank, at law, it's not. Uh, it's their money once you deposit it in their bank. Yep. You're essentially loaning the bank your money. And what you just said, you're unsecured mm -hmm. in the process. You mentioned the re the reevaluation of the debt market. Can you uh, touch on that a little bit? Well, uh, yeah, we could uh, do what we did to Russia and weaponize the dollar, which we've already done, and just say, uh, you know, you're a foreign creditor. We're not going to make good on the, you know, on our debt markets to you because you're now our enemy. And of course, that will just decimate the whole system. I mean, will that happen? I doubt it, but it's a possibility. Like I said about you know, a runaway stock market. It's not high on my list. I think the probability is low, but the probability does exist. So you could say you, meaning the United States Treasury or really the Federal Reserve uh, would say, we're cutting off um, our interest payments to you. You know, you want to roll over your bonds. We're not going to honor that anymore. And this would really create havoc. And they know it. Both sides know it. I mean, if China couldn't get, you know, trust the dollar anymore, then what happens? And, you know, Russia can't really trust the dollar anymore. We cut them off for what, 300 million or something. So this was the beginning of the end, in my view. And that's why I'm stronger than ever about we're approaching the, the finality of this false system that's based on a lie. We can create something for nothing and print our way out of this. We can't. <clears throat> but yet the banks aren't going to lose control. They're going to uh, maintain the control if they can. And the way they've set it up, hypothetically with the CBDCs is to not only maintain the control they ha have, but gain further control, have even more control over the financial system or the money system. And that's, of course, their wish. And it's been implemented in China. So that's sort of the blueprint for the globalists. It's like uh, you have to get onto the new system and we you know, watch everything that you do. And we can basically program the money so that you can or cannot buy or can or cannot travel based on the algorithm we set up against you or your bank account or your corporation or whatever. And now you're basically beholden to them. And if your political think is incorrect, then they can close down your bank account. They can modify it. They can scold you. They can dock you. They can uh, put up a, you know, let's say, uh, dock your account because you are politically incorrect. It's uh, the paradox of 1984. You know, it's the uh, <clears throat> freedom is slavery kind of mode. You know, it's double think. 
um, ignorance is strength. I mean, these things out of 1984 are right before us, and most people understand or feel it. Uh, some can articulate it, some cannot. But I think it's at the point now where both sides, whatever your political persuasion is, understand that something is drastically wrong. Both, in my view, are wrong about the solution. I don't think there is a political solution to the problem at this point. I think it's back from a bottoms up solution, which means we, the people, have to come together in an ideology that's beneficial to all, regardless of your race, color, or creed. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with humanity. And I think we can do that. Certainly, I'm working on that. I'm working on a documentary to kind of talk about what's going on, the problem, which I've done for 20 plus years, but more of what the solutions could be. So you mentioned the CBDCs um, in what you just talked about there, David. Is there really an appetite for CBDCs here in the United States? You know, granted, they 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 might have a place there in China, but the, the American people are a lot different than the people in China. How would they pull off something like a CBDC implementation here in the states or in the West in general? Let's say. Yeah, my gut feel is there isn't a big appetite, but remember, I'm biased because I've been on the sound money, you know, freedom movement, you know, a student of Murray Rothbard, et cetera. So certainly I have a different lens to look through than most people. Having said that, I think there is a lot of resistance. I mean, you have states that have already mm -hmm. put up ideas of not accepting the CBDC in their state. We've also had, um, you know, some pushback for some pretty, you know, well-known entities. Nonetheless, uh, as things deteriorate more, that could entice people to jump on it because of a universal basic income. And if you look at the job losses, forget the official numbers. They're basically contrived the way they you know, come up with you know, these massive employment numbers. I mean, real quickly to digress, you know, someone that's working two jobs or three jobs has added to the labor force, but that's one person that used to make you know, $75,000 a year and lost their job at the xyz software company and now they're working at walmart mcdonald's and uh, the local clothing store three jobs just to make uh, fifty thousand a year uh but it looks on statistics or st statistically oh geez look we've added two jobs to the labor force isn't that wonderful well it's one person working three jobs and that's valid is that in every case of course not but you got to be real careful about how these numbers are massaged and the hedonic indexing and all these crazy things they've come up with to put the balance of statistical economic activity in their, their favor, uh, showing lower inflation than it really is, showing better job numbers than it really is, and skewing it or distorting it to adhere to the big lie that don't worry, everything's under control, we know what we're doing. All that is a false narrative. Yeah. And, and the data kind of plays into their policies there at the Fed. Uh, the Fed currently has rates at 550 basis points, signal they want to cut this year. Do you think that they cut earlier in the year to try to influence the election, maybe later in the, in the year so they come across as a more independent agency? Uh, what, what do you think happens there in terms of interest rate cuts? Well, I'm kind of a lone wolf on this. I've been saying for quite some time, when many of my friends said, you know, one and done, they would, uh, you know, raise interest rates once or twice and then stop. And that's not what happened. I've been uh, on the other side most of the time saying that I think they'll continue to raise interest rates until something breaks. Uh, I think lots of things have broken. If you look again at the, you know, the decimation, the retail market, what happened during the illness, how many small businesses were wiped out never to come back. I mean, if you do that on aggregate and see how many jobs were lost in the real economy, how, how uh, decimated the real economy is versus the financial markets that paint a different picture, you see the reality of the situation. I think that trend continues. So my thought is that interest rates will probably stay high probably to the end of the year, or at least you're not going to see any cuts um, before you know June, July. I really don't think you will. And the markets may dictate more to the Fed than most people realize, because, again, the part that most people miss is the psychology of inflation. You got the average workers out there that don't have a stock 
or brokerage account. They don't have time. They keep their money in the bank and they pay their bills. And more and more, they can do it less and less because of the distortions in the market. And so the stock market doesn't mean that much to them. They don't really care if the Dow's making a new high or the S&P's making a new high or you know, what NVIDIA is doing or you know how great Tesla is. They don't really care. What they care about is do they have enough to pay their bills at the end? And because of that fact, they are ingrained with inflation, inflation, inflation. And that's in their mind more than what the stock market's doing, which means they're predisposed from this point forward until shown otherwise that they got to be really careful with how they spend their money at the grocery store and throw up the car and any discretionary purchases they make. So you've got an inflation psychology that's built into the masses that the Fed overlooks because, you know, they're all knowing, all seeing, and they're you know, masters of the universe, and therefore they can, uh, you know, tweak the dials and dial the economy in whichever direction they want it to go, which is a false premise altogether. I mean, that's been proven throughout history always, and we're in a failing situation, as I keep saying. So that inflationary bias uh, is a lot of little people voting with their dollars. And so I think it's going to be a little harder for interest rates to uh, move down than most of my peers. Am I right or wrong? Time will tell. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've maintained the assertion that Powell and the Fed, they've essentially already cut rates without it actually cutting rates by virtue of signaling that they're going to cut rates. Right. And look what they've done. They've driven the markets all the way up to new all-time highs, all this other stuff. So I, at this point, there really isn't much incentive for them to cut rates, don't you think? I agree. Well said. Yeah. So, and another thing, uh, just kind of uh, reverse back to the CBDCs. Uh, uh, an example of a very primitive and early prototype of CBDCs is what they did with the Canadian truckers a couple years back. You know, this is that's exactly how it'd be implemented, except it would be a lot more seamless, a lot more efficient, and a lot more invasive. So, you know, yeah, if I could just add on for a moment, you know, when they did that, of course, we weren't on a CBDC, and yet they were able to go into the yeah. truckers. And uh, null and void their crypto accounts. And I pointed that out in an interview. And a woman uh, on the comment section said, Wow, you know, that's important to note because uh, some thinking is, well, we have to be on a CBDC to have all this control over the system. Not true. The truckers proved that. Uh, Hey guys, quick pause. I won't take too much of your time, but I just wanted to let you know that if you want to use and read the same newsletter that I do, Capitalist Exploits, we have a special $1,000 discount exclusively for Capital Cosm viewers of this channel. You simply have to click on the link down below, get your $1,000 discount. Super stoked about this. I discovered Chris and Brad newsletter, Capitalist Exploits, Four years ago, it set me on my investment journey. I attribute a ton of what I know to that newsletter. So if you haven't already, check them out. Click the link down below to learn more. Take advantage of this $1,000 discount. You're not going to find it anywhere else. All right, now let's get back to the video. You don't have to be in the new system in order for them to uh, basically stop any payment, be conventional through the banking system or unconventional through a cryptocurrency. And if that doesn't scare you, I don't know what does. Yeah, you know, just just imagine what how prominent the system, their CBD system will be, you know, once they if they ever do get it in place compared to what we have today. I mean, they were able to do all that, the entirety of what they ran the truckers through, the gambit, closing out their bank accounts with just what we have today. So just imagine what it will be like once they actually get the policies that they want intact. Uh, let's shift over to. Uh, geopolitical side of things the world is imbued with conflicts all over the place ukraine middle east etc but oil price is still sitting at 78 dollars hasn't moved energy prices are still fairly stable uh you've got the red sea the houthis there shooting off all these different cargo ships uh, how how is how is the energy market still unwavering despite all this insanity Manipulation. <laughs> Probably manipulated more than the metals markets. Uh, really, the world runs on energy. And regardless of the green movement, which is just a few percent of how energy uh, you know, comes to the fore, it's oil, basically. 
oil, natural gas, coal, your hydrocarbons. And uh, so if you could keep that stability in the market, that really helps everything else. Uh, it helps the, you know, the financial markets, stock markets, the bond markets, everything else, because you know, people want stability. They want that security. They want to know that tomorrow is going to be a lot like today. And the primary force to do that is the energy markets. And again, that means oil. So if you're able to keep the oil market stable by whatever means, it certainly gives a lot of confidence, either conscious or unconscious, throughout the entire system. And that's important. Uh, I'm not saying we should manipulate the oil price. I believe in free markets. But nonetheless, that is a way to have a subtle manipulation that very few people think about that actually holds the glue of everything together because it does. And so if that gets out of hand or the market adjusts because they lose control of the ability to keep it within a certain trading range, then you could have a very, very different type of approach to the stability of the financial systems. I was trying to go a bit further. I used to do most of my speeches early on. I put out a small video that was kind of a shocker, kind of like a brain tease to like wake people up. And then after that shocking two or three minute video, I would start my speech. And in the early days, I did one. It was called The Man Who Controlled or Destroyed Britain. I forget the exact title. And it wasn't about George Soros and the Bank of England. It was about uh, a miscue in the oil market. And someone bank had a wrong side bet on the oil price because of the breakout of war in the Middle East. And the oil market went through the roof. And this took down a lot of banks instantaneously because they're all interconnected and they're all on the wrong side of the bet. And what the chaos was that developed. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it was a precursor to what could happen and how important the oil markets are for the global economy. And so it's something that uh, we certainly have to keep an eye on. I do, in fact, this month's report. Um, in the Morgan Report, it's going to be about conventional energy versus uh, the new green movement and where we really stand and what I see going forward. No one knows the future, but I've been pretty good. In fact, usually early on uh, what I see as far as where we're going in the longer term. Yeah. So going from oil, energy, let's talk about precious metals. Precious metals have also been moving sideways. Silver has been moving sideways for four years now, close just about. What's going on with the precious metals? Well, I think gold's pretty much doing its job. I mean, gold is signaling that it's ready to break out into a new high. The magic number 2000 USD has pretty much become a floor or a support level, which is very close to the all-time high. And once gold breaks through that and establishes a new high and, and continues momentum from there, I think you'll see more, um, at least retail, but probably you see everyone across the board, more participation in the gold market. And will that bring silver up? I think it will. Um, silver is a different animal. Silver has become much more of an industrial metal than a monetary metal, although it holds both properties in my very steady view. I would never call it, at least at this point, only an industrial commodity. In fact, that's kind of the beauty of it. I mean, if gold had an industrial offtake of 50% of the market every year, you'd probably have a much higher gold price. But you have silver where over 50% is eaten up by industry every year, and yet it stays flat or sideways. Regardless, uh, silver does have monetary aspects. It's called the poor man's gold. The word silver and the word money is synonymous in the Romance languages. And the people that know, know. And the people that don't know can learn fast when you start to see a deterioration in the financial markets, particularly the monetary system, basis the U.S. dollar. So I'm still bullish on the metals. I do think, you know, I take a lot of flack and probably justifiably so because I'm not a permable. I've called the top every time. I've urged people to take profits. I've asked them to build cash and wait. I mean, I've done my best to try to mitigate this situation that I saw years ago about how these things always end badly. And wanted to protect, you know, the gen the population at large, be them individuals or institutions or somewhere in between. Nonetheless, it hasn't happened yet, yet it's unfolding in front of us. So I think there will be a rush to silver because it's such a small market. And really, you have more power in the silver market than the gold market because gold is really an establishment metal. Look at all the central banks that have bought silver and continue to buy silver. But no central bank uses silver as a monetary asset. 
But if one or two did, it could reprice silver versus gold in an instant because there's so little silver relative to gold on a percentage basis versus what there used to be back in days that gone by when both gold and silver were monetary assets and nothing else. What's interesting is the gold silver ratio back then was set at 15 or 16 to one. And yet the amount of silver to gold above ground was far more silver than gold. And yet the ratio was much lower. Now that you have them about equal and you've got silver and gold's above ground supply about equal, it's at 85. I mean, there's no logic to it at all other than the narrative. Silver isn't money. It's not needed. Banks don't want it. Therefore, you don't want it and forget about it. Yeah. You have these distortions up until you don't. And right. once the market comes to its senses, the longer we're distorted in this market, whether it be through manipulation or just psyoping the public into believing that silver isn't money, once that psyop wears off, that's when you start to see the recorrection, reversion back to the mean. Most people don't know this, but uh, the United States was under a silver-backed currency during the early days up until, let's say, the 1900s or so. That's why you had like the Wizard of Oz. In the book, The Wizard of Oz, uh, the main character, forget her name, she, she, she was wearing silver slippers, right? right? That's, that was the meaning behind it. They, now, in the movie, they changed it to these ruby slippers, but in the, in, in the book, the original canon, uh, she was wearing silver slippers, and the entire movie was an allegory of going back onto the silver standard i just thought it was uh interesting to point that out because silver's been a lot of people mistaken gold as money um for the betterment of the united states and even civilizations as a whole silver's been the go-to choice as as money as well so uh really quick uh, go ahead and take us through the documentary you've got there laid out david and uh, I know you've got some solutions you want to present to to the audience here. Sure. Let me uh, share my screen real quick. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, sir. All right. Okay. So I've started, I decided I'm not going to write another book. I've written three and uh, most people don't read much anymore. They're very much more in tune to, um, you know, watching things, watching videos or listening to audio. Audio and video, so. Yeah. So anyway, I'm starting this uh, silversunrise.tv and the title's a working title. I think I'll keep it, but it could change. Breaking free from the stress, fear, and control of money. That's a subtitle. And that's the key to the movie because we've talked about the problem for years. I'm I'm one of them. And yet we haven't really talked about the solutions that much. And we're certainly going to talk about the problem, but we also want to talk about solutions. So it's going to be in the format of the movie that I was in, and it's not about me being in the movie. But in the About tab where you asked you know, about me and my background, if you go to the morganreport.com, hit the About tab, scroll down, there's a movie called The Four Horsemen. And in that movie, there's a lot of people that talk about the problem and the solution to our ongoing end of the age of empire, how empires come and go. And we're at the end of this one, the American empire. And it's a, so they bring all, all that up to say that this movie has a similar format. There is a narration underneath the entirety of the movie, yet it's interspersed the whole time with interviews of people that are giving their ideas as far as you know what money is, what the problem is, what the solution is, what would they do differently and and that type of thing. So we've got uh, G. Edward Griffin uh, who wrote The Creature from Jekyll Island. He's already been filmed for the movie. Uh, David Icke is uh, committed to being in the movie. Uh, we haven't filmed him yet. We don't even have the opportunity till the end of June. Um, and others uh, of Foster Gamble that did uh, the Thrive series, Thrive 1 and Thrive 2 has agreed to being a movie. So I'm getting some very powerful people um, to give their thoughts. And one of the thoughts is, um, and there are several, this one's mine, this hasn't been put forth by uh, any of those I just mentioned. And it goes back to this uh, documentary or film on Netflix called The Bank of Dave. And this has to do with an entrepreneur in, uh, in the UK that wanted to start a bank. And he was very persistent 
And it was the first bank that came uh, into the fore in like 150 years. And the bank has a different mandate. It's basically of the people, for the people, by the people. And the profits of the bank go to the community. So some of the profits went to better health care for the community, as an example. So banks aren't inherently evil in and of themselves. Uh, yet the whole system is skewed that way, obviously. I mean, but yet it's sort of like a weapon. I mean, it depends on what you do with it. Uh, you can do evil with it or you can do good with it. Um, <clears throat> same thing with a bank. And really, we had a system set up in the 30s under Roosevelt. I'm not a huge fan, but I think one thing that he did well was the Glass-Steagall Act, where there were two types of banks. There were what I call merchant banks, which were banks basically for the people that gave out mortgages and land, you know, uh, money for farming, businesses, and residences, <clears throat> residential properties. In other words, hard, tangible assets that were a benefit to the real physical economy community. And then you had investment banks, which were what I call the game, gambling casinos. I'm using that for emphasis. Of course, we need innovation. But at least when you put your deposit in the bank, you knew what you were doing. So if you're putting your money into a, a commercial bank and not an investment bank, you had a good chance of you know, getting your money back and for it building the community. Whereas if you want to gamble with your money, you put it in an investment bank. Well, that all went away under the Clinton administration. And, and with Mr. Rubin there at the Treasury, basically, I don't know, we just, they're all, all banks are, you know, all banks are equal and they can do whatever they want. So they can be investment or community banks and they're all one. They can do whatever. So you started seeing these banks that were much more conservative move into the gambling arena which basically, for the most part, most of your money center banks are nothing more than huge gambling casinos. And they're so bad at their bets that we've called them too big to fail because as they make irrational, non-productive uh, misallocation of capital across the board in ever-increasing numbers, they can't fail because if they do, they're bailed out by the taxpayer. And now uh, at law, if they fail, they're bailed in by the depositor. And this is not the way to run a system that's equitable to everyone. Uh, you have to pay the price for failure. You get to pay the price for success. But to have a one-sided situation where you can't lose and everybody else does if you do is a way to ruin the system, which is taking place. Gotcha. Did you want to show us a trailer or anything else? Or is yeah, I can. I don't know if it'll... I just want to point out a couple of things. It's a very small website. Uh, the love of money. I'm not anti-money. I'm neutral on it. I think it should be sound and accountable to everyone. I think it should be fair across the board. In other words, honest or sound money. Uh, of course, we go into that. There's two trailers. Uh, there may be another one. Again, what we're, stri we're striving to do is delves into the stress, fear, control, and and what the power that money has to control our lives. If you look up on a search engine and you ask, you know, what's the number one stress for people across the planet, you're going to find about 80%. It's, it's the money problem. You know, I mean, the reason I got into this, first of all, I felt I was called, you know, called the duty, you know, asked to do what I'm doing. I'm very passionate about it, as anyone knows, and trying to be a voice in the wilderness to call out, you know, what's wrong and, and how we can write the system. And <clears throat> there's several solutions, which we're going to go into in this movie. But I think you got to understand the problem and what you can do about it. So as I said, you could go back to, uh, you know, banks that are community banks, North Dakota is one, you can go to Ellen Brown's web of debt, and read about that. Uh, there's a uh, cryptocurrencies that are sound money backed, that you could participate in. Um, in the United States, there are several states that you're allowed to use gold or silver in exchange with anyone as long as both parties agree. So there is a backlash. It's small, but the idea is, is very sound. And there is a possibility that we can take back uh, our future, because if we don't get the money system right, then we're not going to really have our freedom. I mean, there's a direct correlation between the depreciation of the currency and the decline of the moral standards of society at large. 
and we're pretty far down the rabbit hole right now, but that doesn't mean we are at the end. We do have to hit a bottom of some type before people get angry or uh, interested enough to participate in a different way. And, and that's coming here. I mean, look at what's happened since Bitcoin came to the fore. Now, how many cryptocurrencies are there? Thousands. How many are sound money? Not many, but some are. Is that the only solution? No, it's a solution. Again, going back to community banks that are basically uh, community-based and real asset-backed is one, another one. Uh, there's the cryptos. There's using gold and silver directly. And there's several others that uh, we'll bring out in the movie. But uh, the main thing that I talk about that I'll be in the movie is really thinking outside the box. So I'll leave you with this. And that is, if you go to the website URL, themorganreport.com forward slash monkey, M-O-N-K-E-Y, and hit enter, you will see a small clip that will be in the movie. And it's from uh, Harold Katzvella, who does a real quick review of something that was in the New York Times about biologists teaching apes to use money. And it mm. taught them how to use money. He learned it in about three days. And he explains what happened to the social order after they were taught how to use money and what the repercussions were. I won't give it away because I'd like people to watch that. Interesting. Three or four minutes That's a great later. hook. <laughs> but it's a, something that uh, we need to examine. We need to examine our relationship with each other because, you know, it's a humanity thing. It's our interaction with each other. And money is just a way to exchange goods. I mean, we're really exchanging my labor for your labor is what we're really doing. And money's an in-between vehicle. So it's supposedly equitable to both sides because, you know, when I say I want to um, buy, you know, some artwork from you and, you know, you we didn't ask. You say, well, I want this much for it. And I say, well, I'll give you this much silver for it. I say, no but I will take this mess. We both feel we've made a good deal. I feel that I'd rather give up that silver for your art and you'd rather have the silver than the artwork. And that's the way a free market is supposed to work. But in this distorted world that we live in, there's really no financial stability. It's really an unstable system. And that's starting to materialize more and more, even though the narrative is, don't worry, the man behind the curtain has been exposed, but I'm still pulling the levers. Trust me, everything's going to be just fine. And on that note, anything else you want to walk the audience through, David, or uh, any closing thoughts before we, before oh, we uh, head out? Let's leave it there. I am looking for donations on the money since you can still see my screen. There is a donations tab. So, you know, if you want to be part of the cause or, you know, help, I mean, even a $25 donation helps. There's a lot of uh, video clips over here on the left-hand side that haven't loaded, but there's a lot of things that, uh, you know, you can just watch three or four minutes and get a good outline of some of the movies that James Yeager has done in the past. He's the main producer. Um, and you will, depending on your donation, you'll be part of helping the cause to come back to a system that benefits all of us. You know, my mission statement is to teach and empower people to understand the benefits of an honest financial or monetary system. You know, all we want is something that's fair. To teach our kids the one rule that you can't get something for nothing, life isn't fair and you have to work for a living. You know, those <clears throat> facts are really not true because there is a certain class that get to get something for nothing and that's the banking system at large that create basically quote unquote money out of thin air aren't able to spend it in the market as they see fit and get real goods and services for it. And yet who gives them the right to counterfeit? Well, the government does. It protects them to have this central banking system that is as corrupt as corrupt can be. And because it's based on a lie, it will end at some point. So again, you know, if you're inclined, I know there's a lot of people that are stressed on the money as the subtitle and cannot donate, but those that can, uh, that will help the cause. So you will be participating in the revolution. The revolution for as in the Ron Paul movement, the love, because the word love is in there. So let's think with our head and our hearts and think about what we could do together to overcome the, uh, the banking elite and put the power of money back into people's hands. 
when are you anticipating this movie releasing? Probably about six months. Uh, we're just lining up the uh, the interviewees at this time. And I'm underfunded. I'm really kind of at a standstill. I've funded a lot of it myself, but with my current medical bills and everything else that's going on, I do need some help. So that's why I'm asking. Plus, it gives a feeling of well-being to people that truly understand. I mean, just to contribute, you know, 25 bucks or whatever makes them feel good because they know they have help. And if that's all you can afford, that's fine. If you can't afford it, then don't. Just spread the word for me. But uh, there are people of means and maybe, you know, some of these big bullion dealers that I've helped for years, or maybe some of these mining companies that I've helped for years, or maybe some of these, um, you know, investment conferences where I've, you know, helped for years, but want to get their name in the credits, you know, because if this hits Netflix and it goes viral, and this is one of the pillars that really gets the education that we need in a manner that goes to the next level, where we're able to band together and start using sound money and circumvent the system that they provided, we might really be on something here that is going to make a move into the system for the better. I'm not forecasting now, but certainly that's the intent. And if you have a strong intent, a lot of passion, and some pretty good backing behind you, uh, you can do a lot. The idea being that you know, committees, there aren't any statues to committees. You know, there's statues to individuals that made a difference. I'm not saying I need a statue. What I'm saying is that we need individuals to band together for an idea that really is probably one of the most important, at least in my view, to right the wrong. And the right is, to be honest, in our financial affairs. And that will trickle down to all of our interaction because now we're dealing with each other where value for value, where your labor is rewarded with real value and not some digit in the computer somewhere controlled by some people that really don't like you. Right. Fantastic. So you guys go visit the Morgan Report, donate to the movie if you can. Highly recommend it. David, thank you so much for coming on. If you guys enjoyed this content, be sure to give it a like. Comment down below. Let me know what you think. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already so we get more guests like David on the show. And with that said, you guys, I will see you in the next episode. Bye, y'all.